On behalf of the National Commission on Correctional Health Care, I want to welcome you to the specialized training for medical and mental health professionals on PREA requirements. As many of you may know, uh, all correctional staff in any type of correctional facility are required to have training on PREA, but medical and mental health professionals are required to have specialized training. This training has been developed by, under the auspices of the National Commission on Correctional Health Care and uh, the panel that is here with me are part of the content experts who have developed the training. Um, I am Dr. Jay Anno. I'm a correctional health care administrator. My husband and I were the co-founders of the National Commission on Correctional Health Care. I will be serving as the moderator for this particular session. Also with me is uh, Carla Viertaler. She is with the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape, and she is the outreach coordinator for PCAR. Carla, say who you are. Okay, good. Um, then we have Kim Day. She's with the International Association of Forensic Nurses. She's a registered nurse, and she is dual board certified in the care of adult, adolescent, and pediatric sexual assault patients. Next, we have Jane Russell. Jane is a correctional mental health worker who currently is a healthcare consultant. And then we have uh, Robert Dumond. He is the mental health program manager for the Sixth uh, Circuit District Court in Concord, New Hampshire. I want to introduce a couple of other people who are important to this process. We have Dr. Gibson sitting back here. He is the vice president of operations for the National Commission and is really the go-to person who has been the umbrella uh, contact for the development of this specialized training. Then we also are, are happy to have with us uh, Ms. Peg Ritchie. Uh, Peg is a senior program analyst with the PREA Resource Center. Uh, Peg, you have a couple of comments you want to make? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anno, Dr. Gibson, panelists, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I spent many, many years in the field, worked in the Arizona system, and Ted Jolly's here somewhere, and hadn't seen him for like 25 years. Um, worked in the Ohio system. I just spent five years working with the California Department of Corrections, and I served at the National Institute of Corrections for many years, which Dr. Anno was a consultant in uh, medical mental health uh, workshops that we did for many, many years and has done a lot of consulting. So I want to welcome you from the PREA Resource Center as well. There are a few handouts on the front table. If you do not get a copy, jot down your name and your um, email address, and I'll be happy to send it to you. It has a event, upcoming events sponsored by the PREA Resource Center, of which we have a numerous partners, including the National uh, Council, uh, the National Commission, if you I'm sorry, the National Commission, uh, Just Detention International, which Christine uh, is in the room, and ACA, APPA, um, the Moss Group, et cetera, are partners that work with us. We have special presentations such as this that we help co-sponsor. Um, Dr. Gibson is working with us on the curriculum where we're going to start training auditors for PREA in June. Um, we have uh, webinars that are on our website. We have technical assistance, both targeted, which includes um, policy reviews, staff training, human resource, victim services, et cetera. And we're doing regional workshops around the country on many of these topics, investigator training, including saying nurses are part of that. Uh, we're working on a training for trainers for investigators because they have to have specialized training as well. Um, and we have um, different types of demonstration sites and projects that are going on in Colorado being one of them. So many thanks. Welcome. Have a great uh, morning and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Peg. We also want to acknowledge the uh, help from um, the Just Detention International, Linda McFarland, who is the Deputy Executive Director, and especially uh, Christine Craig, who has worked very closely with us in the development of these materials. Just want to give you a little bit of a history of uh, PREA. The Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed by Congress in 2003. The standards, however, weren't released until last May. The DOJ expects its representatives to begin auditing uh, facilities as early as August of this year. Note, however, that as of this point, we do not 
yet have published compliance indicators or uh, auditing tools. But Ms. Ritchie has indicated that they're going to be training people starting in June, so we anticipate that those will be available shortly. Why are you here? Well, obviously because Congress said that this training is mandated for all correctional staff. But that said, it is also the right thing to do. There was a Bureau of Justice Statistics study that found, uh, that was published in 2008, that found that sexual abuse in correctional facilities was a hidden epidemic. Data collected from correctional administrators in 2008 showed only 7,444 reported allegations of sexual victimization. In contrast, sexual victimization reported by former prisoners in 2008 found 9.6% reported one or more incidents during their last incarceration. It, with an estimated population of 1.2 million incarcerated in state prisons in 2008, this would yield almost 120,000 incidents of sexual victimization. This is over 15 times more than the number reported by correctional administrators that same year. There are actually four different sets of standards, one set for adult prisons and jails, another one for lockups, another one for community confinement facilities, and the fourth one for juvenile facilities. There are some differences in the requirements depending on the type of uh, facility. For the most part, we'll be concentrating on those standards for adult prisons and jails, but where there is an item that we are discussing or a requirement uh, where it differs, in one of the other sets, we'll try to point that out as well. All right, definitions. For confined individuals, if you're in an adult uh, prisoner jail, the standard, PREA standards refer to you as an inmate. If you're a detainee, then that means you are in a lockup. And people who are confined in juvenile or community facilities are referred to as residents. What are the prohibited acts under PREA? Yeah. Well, sexual abuse, and that is specifically defined as any contact between the penis and vulva or the penis and the anus, any contact between the mouth and the penis, vulva, or anus, any penetration of the anal or genital openings, any other intentional touching of the genitalia, anus, groin, breast, inner thigh, or buttocks of another person. Voyeurism is also prohibited. Voyeurism by a staff member, contractor, or volunteer is defined as an invasion of privacy of an inmate unrelated to official duties. Then finally, sexual harassment uh, is prohibited. And that is defined as repeated and unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, or verbal comments, gestures, or actions of a derogatory or offensive sexual nature, whether by staff or another inmate. Under staff, the PREA standards distinguish between employees, volunteers, and contractors. And all of them would be considered to be under the umbrella of staff. And then we have healthcare personnel. And PREA standards talk about qualified medical practitioners and qualified mental health practitioners. But what they mean by qualified medical practitioner and qualified mental health practitioner is an individual who has received specialized training under PREA, such as the training that you are receiving today. And then there is the definition of the findings. A substantiated allegation means it was investigated and determined that sexual abuse occurred. An unfounded allegation means it was investigated and determined that sexual abuse did not occur. And then finally, an unsubstantiated allegation means it was investigated, but it could not be determined whether sexual abuse took place. I would like to uh, introduce Carla, who will be giving our first module on detecting and uh, assessing signs of sexual abuse. Carla? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carla Beerteller, and I am the Outreach Coordinator at the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. And uh, I will be representing the victim advocacy point of view today. Um, the sexual violence movement is about 40 years old. Excuse me, anti-sexual violence movement. Um, 
We began uh, in the early 70s with a group of individuals who had survived sexual violence in their lives and wanted to help other survivors. Uh, small groups of individuals who wanted to provide services began in their homes. They started hotlines, 24-hour hotlines, where victims could call for assistance. They started providing group counseling and individual counseling for survivors uh, to find support with other survivors because they knew what kind of support was needed. Uh, and that movement has certainly professionalized over the last 40 years, but we still are, in essence, focused on empowering survivors and providing services, most of which are free and completely confidential. Now, I work at the coalition level, and we support Pennsylvania's rape crisis centers. Every state has a coalition, and they also support those rape crisis centers. Now, not every county will have a rape crisis center, but every state has a coalition. So I encourage you, if you have not already, to reach out to the closest rape crisis center to you, uh, as Priya encourages. And if not, if you can't find services there, do reach out to your state coalition. We are certainly working in Pennsylvania with county jails, with our local rape crisis centers to help support those, also with our Department of Corrections, and also um, many different juvenile detention facilities. Okay, uh, so I do want to say, as I had sh have shared earlier, I am coming from the advocacy perspective. I am not a mental health practitioner, I'm not a neurologist, but I am used to, and my job is, to train on the victim experience and victim behavior. So that is the perspective I'm coming from today. I will certainly be sharing with you things that you all probably know better than I do, but these are tools that we use to share where we're coming from with victims to help you all understand where victims are coming from after a surviving sexual violence, either in the acute phase or long term. Okay, so these are our objectives for, for my presentation, module one. We are going to examine sexual abuse in prisons and how it is defined in PREA. Jay already did that, but I'm going to show you some nuances and talk a little bit about the definition of consent. We are going to learn how to detect signs and symptoms of both acute and prior sexual abuse. We are going to summarize the short and long-term effects of trauma on the brain. We are going to describe considerations for the development of, an inta of intake screening tool requirements, as in PREA, and recognize the healthcare provider's role in the screening process. Okay, so I'm going to share with you a video from Just Detention International. They are our advocacy arm on the national level, actually international level, uh, and they work directly with survivors who are incarcerated. Um, and so this is the story of three survivors that they have worked with. And I want to thank JDI for allowing us to use this and for helping us inform this presentation. Being transgender was not easy at that time. I became homeless. I lost my job. And because I had no means to survive, I had to resolve to the street economy. Because of that, I was arrested. And while I was waiting for my arraignment, I was locked up in the county jail. I was coerced into having sex against my will with another inmate. And during that time, I was exposed um, to HIV. It's almost unbelievable that it, it escalated to the point where it did. But um, I remember, you know, being arrested for being publicly drunk, um, and being terrified because I was in jail, and and I had to um, let them know that you know I'm I was gay and different. I guess they go after the weak, the weakest links, and 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 I was just the target, and and. It, it just became a um, very, um, very terrifying or, ordeal. And um, as I tried to stick up for myself, um, one of the officers made a threat against me and said that he was going to come get me later on. And um, I told on him. And I remember telling his supervisor that the threat this 
this um, officer just made on me. And he said, Mr. Mendoza, you are in LA County Jail. You are in one of the safest facilities around. You have nothing to fear. And um, boy, was he wrong. Everybody's pod was shut except my pod. And I remember what, you know, it seemed eerily quiet. And then as I'm looking around, I see all the guards just like dispersing, just leaving. And my pod is still open. And I'm wondering what's going on. And from the corner of my eye, I see the gentleman, the officer that threatened me earlier, coming towards my cage, com coming towards me. And I was frantically trying to shut it. And I started screaming and yelling. and. Um, you know, to no avail, nobody came to my rescue, and he just came in there and, and manhandled me and stripped me about naked and, and um, sexually assaulted me. I first went into juvenile hall when I was 12 years old. Um, staff ridiculed me. Um, other inmates uh, ridiculed me, uh, gang members. Um, I was uh, forced uh, to oral copulate. Uh, gang members, uh, bloods, and crips in the shower areas. Um, staff often knew what was happening and they turned the other way uh, because staff did not like um, kids my age that were different. So that was a difficult video to watch for sure. Um, Certainly we want to thank those survivors for sharing their stories. We're going to talk a, about victim response a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, but the reason we wanted to start with the video is because we want to show, we want to allow survivors to speak for themselves. That's the essence of why we're here today. Um, yes, we certainly need to follow PREA standards, but the reason we want to do that is so that we can prevent this from happening to other inmates and also to learn how to best treat them when these situations do occur. So thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, Jay had shared this statistics, statistic with you earlier. Again, this is um, from the uh, National Prison Rape Statistics Program. It is the survey of former inmates. Um, these surveys were collected by individuals who are on parole supervision in over 40 states, and there were over 18,000 videos done by former inmates, and they were done in a private uh, room where individuals were interacting with the computer, and there was both an audio and um, survey on the computer, so we really, they really tried to uh, maximize confidentiality and minimize literacy issues with this survey. So just to, to give you a little bit of background there. And they did find that 9.8% of, of former inmates reported sexual abuse while in incarceration. Uh, another thing they did find was that about 5.4% of those who uh, reported sexual victimization were, report, were abused by other inmates, and then 5.3% were abused by, by staff. So it is about half and half reporting of half were abused by other inmates, half were abused by staff. And I think there is a large misconception that most of the abuse that happens in prisons is inmate on inmate abuse, and that is just not the case. And finally, this survey also found that 31% 30 of inmates who reported abuse were abused three or more times while incarcerated. And we're gonna talk about the effects of repeat victimization on the brain and on the psyche and how individuals respond. Okay, so again, Jay talked about some definitions related to PREA, but I wanted to talk about consent because the definitions clearly talk about um, if the victim does not consent. This is inmate on inmate abuse. It talks specifically about the lack of consent. And consent in correctional facilities can be a little bit murky. And we define consent as voluntary cooperation and the exercise of free will. Consent is much more than saying yes to something because certainly coercion exists. Consent cannot be granted through force threat or force, or coercion. And the definition of coercion includes applying pressure that is emotional or psychological in nature, 
trickery, applied threats, blackmail, promises, privileges. Some examples can be uh, demanding repayment for debt, staff promising privileges, or providing contraband or threatening to interfere with visits or any kind of um, work assignments, things like that. And certainly protective pairing is also plays into coercion. So really in, in these examples, sometimes people may quote consent, say yes to interaction, but coercion is happening there and that would still be considered sexual abuse under PREA. Okay. So also, we also wanted to point out when it comes to sexual abuse, when staff is involved, there can be, it can be with or without consent. So even if it is a consensual relationship, it would be considered sexual abuse because the power dynamics are very different between an inmate and staff. And also, this comes into play with sexual harassment. When it's inmate on inmate, it is repeat and unwelcome. And when it is involved with staff, it's just repeated comments or gestures of a sexual nature. Doesn't matter if they're welcome. And I did want to point out also, uh, certainly, we all know in incarceration, uh, there can be consensual sexual relationships between inmates. It is not allowed, but it certainly happens, and those relationships are not covered under PREA. What comes into place, play under PREA is when there is not consent there. Okay, so we know that this is happening, certainly in incarceration, who are targeted? And what we know from uh, JDI and several, several studies, this is a quote from JDI's website, the two leading risk factors of prison sexual abuse, one is being identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and the other is being previously sexually abused. So those are the two main risk factors in numerous studies. We're going to talk a little bit about why previous sexual victimization may, makes a person a target for additional sexual abuse, but I want to briefly go over this definition of LGBTQI. Um, I'm probably sharing information you already know, but I hope you don't mind me repeating this quickly. The definition of transgender, it's often used as an umbrella term to encompass a wide range of people whose gender identity or expression, so how they choose to express their gender, does not match the category society has put them into. Um, so it has nothing to do with sexuality, it has to do with gender expression. Next, intersex also comes up, uh, sometimes questionably, this also has nothing to do with sexuality. It is a general term used for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't fit the typical definitions of male or, or female or who has chromos chromosomal structures other than just XX or XY. And then finally, queer is a term that is used again in another umbrella term for people who do not conform to norms around gender or sexuality. So again, we're using the term umbrella terms a lot. Identity is very individualized, but these are just some rough definitions to give you an, an idea of, of how people may, may identify in uh, institutions. So certainly people who are younger are often targeted. Minors who were charged as adults tend to be targeted. People with disabilities, and this includes a wide range of disabilities. It includes people who may have a mental health diagnosis or mental health issues. It can include people with developmental or intellectual disabilities, and that occurs on a wide spect spectrum. Uh, could be on the autism spectrum, could be uh, any form of mental retardation, IQ-related disabilities, and certainly people with physical disabilities. Someone who may use a wheelchair or a cane to move around, uh, any sort of sensory disability, an individual who might be deaf. All of those are included, and all of those individuals have been shown to be targeted more for sexual victimization within incarceration. People who are biracial or multiracial, 
and certainly people who have been victims of previous sexual abuse. And again, we are going to certainly go into what happens when an individual has become a victim, some changes that occur, may occur in the brain that may make a person more vulnerable to sexual victimization in the future. And the other thing we want to point out is that this list is not very different in the general population. I certainly do training uh, to all types of audiences, uh, and we know that in the general population, people with disabilities are targeted for sexual abuse very, very widely. Um, children are targeted. We know that one in four girls and one in six boys be will become victims of sexual abuse before the age of 18. It's a huge, large number of the population. We know that women with developmental disabilities, 82% will be victims of sexual abuse in their lifetime, half of that number. So about 40% will be victimized 10 or more times in their lifetime. And sexual abuse, we don't have great statistics. It is the most underreported violent crime, according to the FBI. And we know it's also a very highly private crime. People don't like to talk about it. So what we have are varied statistics, but these are things that we do know. And what we try to focus on is, is why are people being victimized? Why are these groups being targeted? Because perpetrators don't want to get caught. They want to have, they want to choose a victim who will, is, who is unlikely to be believed if they come forward, who's not very credible in some cases. They want to get away with sexually abusing somebody and not get caught. And we see that th these are the individuals in prisons who are less likely to be believed and not as credible, unfortunately. Okay. Just uh, another statistic for you. Uh, the first one on the left is, again, going back to that former prison survey, one in three gay and bisexual men were sexually abused while in custody. And then another study done in California state prisoner, prisons, 59% of transgender inmates reported sexual abuse compared to 4% of other inmates. So we know that these groups are being, certainly being targeted. Okay, um, one of the things our groups express when we were kind of coming up with uh, this curriculum, obviously we're all coming from different perspectives, uh, different fields, and one of the things that came up was, well, why wouldn't a person report? If this was happening to them in a prison or jail or any kind of incarcerated facility, why would they not report? Again, from the former prisoner survey, and people were allowed to choose more than one response, Number one reason is that they did not want anybody to know. And I will tell you, this is what we hear all the time in the general population. I just want to pretend like this didn't happen to me. Um, they feel ashamed or embarrassed. They are afraid of the perpetrator, afraid of retaliation, afraid of, they thought staff would not investigate, and then finally being afraid of being punished by staff. So these are all certainly real reasons why people would not report. I want to share a couple more statistics from you. Again, same survey. 37% of victims of inmate-on-inmate -inmate sexual victimization said they reported at least one, one incident to facility staff. So 37% did report inmate-on-inmate -inmate abuse. And I would like to point out that that is a higher percentage than in the general population. Again, according to FBI crime statistics, 23, roughly, changes every year, 23% um, of victims of sexual abuse report that to law enforcement. So again, not the ma majority does not report for reasons that are very similar to why in former inmates did not report. Uh, unfortunately, reporting to medical or mental health was less common. Only 14% of survivors reported to you all. So just important to recognize that. Um, and then finally, 5.8% of victims of staff sexual misconduct reported abuse to other staff. So that's compared to 37% who would experience inmate on inmate abuse. So, and we know that it's happening at equal rates. So that's just another kind of important thing to take note of. Okay, now we're gonna talk about physical indicators and potential responses to sexual abuse. Um, as I had shared earlier, this is a huge part of my job, talking about signs and symptoms of sexual abuse. And I've certainly done this with uh, 
state mental health hospitals and parents and uh, people in nursing homes and personal care homes and police officers, wide ranges of audiences. And oftentimes, and rightfully so, people want me to give them a list, a checklist, so they can know what signs and symptoms there are, so they can know if sexual abuse is happening in people's lives. And I'm sure you all know that I cannot share that list with you. There is no list. Um, certainly, every survivor responds differently. It's difficult to track physical responses or physical signs and symptoms, as, as Kim is going to talk about today, um, with you a little bit more. So these are just some potential signs and symptoms and responses. Uh, that could be indicators of sexual abuse or something else that's going on with individuals. Um, so I just want to share that disclaimer with you. Okay, so some physical indicators. Certainly sexually transmitted infections and or diseases. Unexplained pregnancies. Pretty, pretty obvious there. Uh, stomach or abdominal pain, oftentimes... Uh, Abuse will sort of manifest itself as a physical pain, generally around the, uh, the stomach area. Any anile, penile, vaginal discharge, bleeding, pain, difficulty in walking or sitting, and any unexplained injury. So those are some physical indicators, not a great list as, as you saw. Some potential responses to victimization, uh, more emotional, and what you might see in prisons. And this is sort of what you would think you would see. These are responses to trauma. These are known psychological responses to trauma that people will share. Um, acting out, anger, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, numbness, disbelief, difficulty concentrating. All of these are very common. They could be a response to incarceration as well, because we know that that, that will also has, have effects. But we know that a crisis interpretation interrupts a survivor's ability to manage life. And certainly in correctional facilities, that's really not allowed. You have places to be, you have things to do at certain times. You don't have the time to disengage, to numb out, um, to have difficulty with daily routines. Daily routines are what you need to be doing in a facility. So oftentimes people will, quote, act out, act difficult, um, sort of engage in risk-taking behavior, which puts them in a dangerous situation. They certainly can get in trouble. There are ramifications for acting out, but oftentimes we see that this happening because there is no other way to kind of express what's going on uh, with the response to, to the traumatic situation. Okay. So some impacts on the incarceration. How is it a little bit different? Uh, those were with general population, certainly. So impact on incarceration on survivors. And we, I think we covered a lot of this. Retaliation is a huge one that is an additional fear. Ongoing contract with perpetrators can be a huge issue if a person does not report they may put themselves in a situation, not put, they may be in a situation where they have no choice but to interact with their perpetrator or perpetrators or individuals they know, know the perpetrator and know what happened. Terrifying situation. Uh, they know that there is an increased likelihood of re-victimization, either from becoming labeled as a victim or the, in that retaliation piece. There is a real threat of punishment or isolation. Oftentimes, if a person reports sexual victimization, they are isolated to keep them safe, which can be further traumatizing on the individual. There is certainly a limited access to services. We know that Priya is really trying to push access to uh, sexual victimization advocacy services, but you know, if you come forward and ask for services, you are identifying yourself as a perpetrator, or excuse me, as a victim. Um, so that's limited. So, and, you know, we're talking about a little control over our bodies and environments. I could go to a rape crisis center of, of free will. It, when If I was in an incarcerated situation, I don't have those choices. I don't have those options. Um, certainly, you can't make phone calls. We do have 24-hour hotlines at rape crisis centers, but they may not be on my call list. And if I put them on my call list, I could be identifying myself as a victim. Uh, I do want to talk briefly about this little control over body or environment. What we know 
uh, from doing this work for 40 plus years in the advocacy movement is that empowerment, giving survivors choices and control over some things that happen in their lives after a victimization is hugely important to helping a person heal. And that is not, that cannot happen a lot of times in incarceration. We're gonna talk about, Bob's gonna talk about reporting. If I choose to go forward right now and go to the hospital, I can choose whether or not I talk to police. I can choose whether or not my inf information is shared about what happened to me. A person who is incarcerated do, does not have those choices to share. So that is a huge difference uh, of, of survivors and the impact of incarceration. Okay. So some potential long-term responses. Uh, primarily what I want to talk about here is post-traumatic stress disorder. Certainly not all individuals will meet the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder after experiencing sexual victimization, but a lot of the characteristics will come forward. Now again, I am not a therapist, but these are, I'm going to share with you the characteristics of post-traumatic stress disorder, which I'm sure you already know. But these really sum, sum, summarize the long-term effects an individual may come forward with. So for, uh, according to be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, there are six criteria. One is that you need to have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event, which is the stressor. Two, you need to have intrusive recollection, meaning you are remembering, feeling like you're reliving, dreaming about the traumatic event on a regular basis repeatedly. Third is there is an avoidant or numbing phase, meaning you're avoiding the people, places, and things associated with what happened to you, associated with a traumatic event. Now think about this in, in an incarcerated situation. If you were sexually abused in a prison, it's not very easy to avoid people, places, and things associated with that event. Uh, the fourth is hyperarousal. These are persistent symptoms of having difficulty sleeping, irritability or outbursts of anger, difficulty concentrating, hypervigilance, and an exaggerated uh, startle response, meaning, again, hyperarousal. You are ready. You are on edge. And we're going to talk about that response a little bit. Uh, when we talk about the neurobiology of trauma in the next couple slides, what our brain, what is, what our brain is saying after we've experienced these traumatic events, and then when we are either dealing with the trauma response or ongoing threats to our safety. And then uh, the fifth criteria is this: these responses need to be happening for one month or more. And then finally, uh, the disturbance causes a clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other er important areas of functioning. So those are the six criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. And we know that this is very common in victims of sexual assault, and I'll share a statistic with that in the next slide. I do want to share that I'm sure mo many of you know that the DMS is going to come out with a new version sixth version, fifth version, excuse me, in May of this year. And the one thing that is changing in the diagnosis of PTSD is that it will no longer be considered an anxiety disorder, but it will be considered a trauma or and stressor-related disorder. This is huge. This is recognizing the effects of trauma and stress on the mind and body. And the, that the DMS, DSM is recognizing it, this is huge. And I think this really will this signifies the importance of what we're talking about today, which is the effects of trauma on the mind and body, which is so important, obviously, to the work that you are doing in facilities. So uh, just some statistics. Victims of sexual abuse are, and this is from the World Report on Violence and Health from the World Health Organization, which was, uh, this was study was done on a global level in 2002. And we know that victims of sexual abuse are three times more likely to suffer from depression, six times more likely to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, 13 times more likely to abuse alcohol, 26 times more likely to abuse drugs, and four times more likely to contemplate suicide. And I'm sure you all are well aware that the individuals that you are working with who are incarcerated have these higher rates as well than the general population. These are the people that you're working with. So part of 
what we wanted to share today is yes, it's important to recognize victimization when it's occurring, but it's also important to recognize that many of the people that you're working with already have been victims of sexual abuse sometime in their lives and may be displaying these signs and symptoms, but not identifying the trauma that they've experienced in their lives. Okay, so again, we're gonna talk, as I had said, about how trauma changes the brain. Again, I am not a neurologist. I am gonna share with you some research, um, but this is a, we found this is a very effective way to share why victim behavior is what it is, because I'll be honest, it's very confusing. People may not remember what happened to them when you think, oh my gosh, how could they not remember this person's face or what they were wearing? Why would you not wanna identify your perpetrator? And this really helps explain kind of what happens on a very basic level to individuals in this traumatic experience. So there is a traumatic event that occurs, and what happens in the brain is there is a human stress response, and these hormones are released, and they are to help us respond to trauma, to respond to this life-threatening event. And there's two points I wanna share with you about what happens automatically. And all of these things are automatically. This is our mammalian response to what is happening to us. We don't get to make choices. There's a threat to life. Our brain sends a signal to our body. We don't get to think about, well, what do I wanna do here? Should I fight back? What should I do? No, our body tells us what it's going to do. And we're very familiar with, the two, with fighting or fleeing in response to traumatic information. But what other, there is another response that has been well documented in mammals and in humans, which is freezing, which we don't talk a lot about. So freezing is really, it's actually called, excuse me, tonic immobility. Our body literally freezes and or plays dead in the traumatic incident. So we can't move, we are literally temporarily paralyzed, and our brain has told our body to do this. And um, when, we come, when we release materials to you all, we will have the scientific research that's been done on, on tonic immobility. Um, but it's very fascinating, because oftentimes we'll hear from, from victims of sexual assault in the community, certainly in police interviews, and they'll say, why didn't you fight back? Especially with men, uh, male victims of sexual violence, there's this feeling of, why didn't you fight back? Or why didn't you run and get away? And they say, I, I don't know. I just froze. And oftentimes victims will report, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know why I did that. And they're very frustrated with their own bodies for not doing those things. And what we're learning is that that is, the brain is telling the body to do so. We don't know why people choose, where, why the body freezes instead of fighting back and or fleeing, but we know that it's happening. So this is just one thing we wanted to share with you all because you may hear this from individuals that you're working with who have experienced sexual abuse and they may be very frustrated as to why this happened, why their body responded that way. And so we wanted to share that piece with you. The other piece that we wanted to share with you is that stress hormones interfere with the way that we are able to store memory. So what we'll hear from victims all the time is if they, let's say someone was uh, abused, uh, assaulted by a stranger in an alley, they may not remember what that person's face looked like, even if they were right here, but they will remember the cologne they had on or the brand of shoe that they had on and the accent color. And that's very strange and certainly frustrating for police who want to solve the case. They're, they say, I can't get anything out of this individual. They, they remember weird things. And that are, those are the, the effects of the stress hormones on the brain. They, it interferes with the ability to store memories. It interferes with the way that we are able to remember. And oftentimes survivors, survivors uh, will report, oh gosh, I had a flashback of something. That's the brain slowly releasing information as it becomes safer to do so. And I think the point of all of this is that our brains are going back to how we were when we were mammals living on, I mean, these, this is very primal responses that doesn't make logical sense in how we process and deal with things now, but they will come into play when you're working with survivors. So we wanted to share the, those pieces.
uh, what we know happens, and this is both in the immediate response, and then when we start talking about the trauma response, when either a person experiences ongoing threats, or when a person is experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder and the trauma is continuing to live on in their brains. We know that there is an emotional stimuli that's either a real threat or that psychological threat. And instead of going up to our human brain, the part of our brain, the cerebral cortex, the part of our brain that plans and reasons and thinks things out, that part is skipped with the trauma response. We completely skip that part and we go straight to the amygdala, the, mam the mammalian response. We start responding without logic and in that hypervigilant way that we had talked about earlier. And so that reason piece may not make sense to all of us when we're witnessing it. Well, why is this person acting out and getting themselves in trouble and having things taken away from them, privileges? You know, they, they may be putting many things at risk if they're in the community corrections and they've been granted privileges. All of these things come into play. Why are they making these choices that aren't logical all of the sudden? That is what ha is happening in, uh, here. We are, they are acting as, as mammals, as hypervigilant mammals. This is a, just a, showing it in a different way. This chronic hyperarousal, both increased continuous threat, so those, that fear of retaliation, or if it's ongoing abuse that's occurring, certainly in protective pairing, we know that that happens a lot. That chronic hyperarousal has an effect on the brain. Or it could be the person is experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. And when we looked at that definition, so many things come to play in incarcerated situations. You can't change your people, places, and things. You may not be able to separate yourself with contact with the perpetrator. So there's always these fears, these threats that this may occur again. And what happens is the brain kind of hardwires itself to respond quickly. You are ready to respond to trauma the brain is ready to respond to trauma. So what you see is a lot of uh, the inability to calm down, a lot of anxiety, uh, difficulty sleeping, irritability, impulsion, people acting without. All of these things come into play when we talk about that. Okay, and one final slide for you. Uh, this is a picture of an MRI, and this was uh, research done by uh, Dr. Bremer, who is a professor of psychology and radiology at Emory, and he has studied uh, individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, and what he found was that the size of the hippocampus is affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. So the brain literally is not as big. What happens in the hippocampus is that it has the, re the ability to regenerate neurons as functioning, so it continuously grows. And what happens when a person has post-traumatic stress disorder? Stress interferes with that regeneration, and literally the brain shrinks. The hippocampus shrinks. This, this brain with PTSD has an 8% reduction in the size of the hippocampus. So it's always, it's, it's interesting to, to think about that and learn about that and learn more about the brain. I hope you, I hope you found it interesting as well. All right, now we're going to talk about assessment and screening requirements in the PREA standards and your role there. There is a screening requirement for the risk of victimization and abusiveness when a person enters a facility. This needs to be done within 72 hours of the person's arrival to a facility. And this is required to be done by a, quote, objective screening instrument. Now, there is no standard screening tool. Um, facilities are encouraged to create their own. And certainly, I think when those start to be created in different facilities across the country, those will, some of those examples will be at the PREA Resource Center. But we don't have something to give you right now, but we know that that tool needs to be objective. And then we also know that there are specific things that need to be included in the tool. So what needs to be included? One, whether the inmate has a mental, physical, or developmental disability, the age of the inmate, the physical build of the inmate, whether the inmate has previously been incarcerated, whether the inmate's criminal history is exclusively nonviolent, 
whether the inmate has prior convictions for sexual offenses against an adult or child. Now I'll ask you a question. Do you think that person, if a person has a prior conviction for sex offenses, do you think they are more or less likely to become victimized in, 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 when incarcerated? More likely, yeah. So it's, it's interesting that these are the standards that were created by Priya, uh, knowing what the risk factors are for individuals. Whether the inmate is, is or perceived to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex, or gender non-conforming. Whether the inmate has previously experienced sexual victimization. Interesting here, the inmate's own perception of vulnerability. So, so the standards also recognize that choice is important here as well. So does, does the person perceive themselves to be vulnerable? Would they like to uh, have more protection or be placed uh, in a different place than a person who has a higher risk of becoming a perpetrator? Uh, and whether the inmate is detained solely for civil immigration purposes. So all of these things need to be part of the screening tool. Now I do have, um, some notes of differences. This is in prisons and jails. The youth screening uh, is slightly differ different. It takes into account developmental stages of adolescence. It also has some different wording. Uh, for example, there is the fifth standards. It deals with the uh, emotional and cognitive development of individuals in juvenile detention facilities. And then finally, um, any other specific information about individual residents that may indicate a heightened need for supervision. So there's a, a one where people can identify any, any, any perceived risks that may not be in this list. Finally, community confinement facility standards are also slightly different with fewer items and a focus on um, conviction history. So just to point out those, those differences. And we want to make note of a couple things on this list. Uh, as you can see, these are pretty personal questions. Um, asking about a person's previous victimization, asking about their, their sexual um, identity or gender identity, pretty personal. Um, any prior convictions, all of these things are sensitive questions. So we do encourage you to take that into consideration when asking these questions, when doing this screening. Uh, we encourage you all to do it if possible, but we know that that's not possible in every case. So if you all could have a hand and a role in training individuals who will be doing the screening, that would be also great. Um, and I think that's really the keys that we wanted to share there. Okay, use of screening information. So this comes into play when you are determining, or when it is determined where a person will be housed, slept, where they will sleep, where they will work, their education, their program assignments, uh, and the overall goal, as you probably know, is to keeping those who are high risk of being victimized apart from those who are at high risk of being abusive. And it really should inform every aspect of how a person is incarcerated and the decisions that are made there. And this is a standard reserve for lockups. Okay. The agency shall make individual determinations about how to ensure the safety of each inmate. This standard talks specifically uh, about transgender and intersex inmates and, and how to house them and how to determine what should be happened, what should happen with these individuals. We know um, that the, it, the standards say that it should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. They also say that um, the individual's own views should be taken into account, where they wanna be placed, how they wanna be placed, how they feel most safe. Uh, transgender or intersex individuals should have the opportunity to shower separately from other inmates. And also, um, there should not be dedicated facilities, units, or wings solely to a person, to individuals based on their sexual identity or status. So just to share that information. All right, protective custody. And uh, this, only apl this applies only to prisons and jails. It is reserved in the lockup juvenile and community confinement standards. And basically what it says is that if a person 
uh, a person who is at risk for sex high, high risk for sexual victimization, they should not be placed in an involuntary segregated housing unless an assessment of all available alternatives have been made. Uh, and there's nowhere else for that individual to go. Basically, it's saying because a person is at high risk, they should not be punished. And oftentimes, involuntary segregation is a punishment. Um, the other piece of that is if, they, if, a per, if a facility cannot conduct an assessment immediately within that 72 um, hours, that uh, they can be housed there for t 24 hours before the assessment is done. Okay. Finally, very close to the end here, we wanted to talk about screening. We do, there is a requirement that if a person is indicated to have been a victim of prior sexual victimization or has previously perpetrated sexual abuse, that mental health or medical staff follow up with the individual within 14 days of the intake screening. Now we do know that uh, in jails, it is only for individuals who have experienced prior sexual victimization. So that obviously directly influences you all and, and makes a difference in your job. And finally, uh, just a little piece around confidentiality and reporting requirements. And Bob's certainly gonna talk a bit, a lot more about this, but we just wanted to note that basically, ev ev even though there is a reporting requirement of sexual abuse that happens during incarceration, that is still considered, it should only be shared when necessary. Uh, and then finally, when we're talking about prior victimization that did not happen during incarceration, that is also considered confidential information. And again, Bob's gonna talk more about that. And that wraps it up for my piece on detection and assessment. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Kim Day to talk to you more about the forensic exam. Thank you for your uh, interaction and your attention.